Ninth grade. What's going on, guys? Uh, Mr. O'Leary here, coming uh, pre-recorded from my living room. Um, I miss you guys. I hope everybody's doing all right, despite what's going on uh, out there right now. Um, trying a new thing today. We're recording um, a video from a slideshow that I created last year. Um, and then I'm going to turn it into an Ed puzzle and ask you a couple open-ended questions. Um, first open-ended question that's going to pop up. Um, Zoom. Okay. So I want to have some Zoom conferences. I want to check in with you guys. Um, I honestly feel ripped off. I was supposed to um, get to teach you guys in person um, for a couple more months and that got cut short. So, you know, I feel lucky. Um, the fact that you're only in ninth grade, you know, I can get you on the back end in 12th grade again, um, which is not the same for my seniors, unfortunately. But yeah, so right here, um, a question is going to pop up, fill out what kind of day and time works for you for having a Zoom conference next next week. All right, so getting into it. World War II, everybody loves this for whatever reason. Um, horrific time period, absolutely atrocious, evil people, okay, evil. Um, but it's interesting, right? Because this is not a normal thing. And I, and I think that's why it piques people's interest, not because they love violence. Um, you know, it's like, it's like a train, train crash or a car crash. You, you can't look away. Um, and that, yeah, that, that's pretty much the best analogy I can do. So uh, World War II overview, right? I, there's, there's a few years in between World War I and World War II. Um, but we, we can play catch up pretty quick. I, I really want you to get... Um, plenty of time to learn about this because this is really what shapes the modern world today. Um, you know, it's, it's been less than a hundred years, only 80 years ago. Um, actually really, if, if you're looking at Nanking, it's, it's only like 90 years ago. Um, but yeah, so world war two overview, um, world war two was the biggest and deadliest war in history. It involved more than 30 different countries. Um, historians Historians tend to say that it sparked on September 1st, 1939, with uh, the Nazis invading Poland, right? The country uh, just to the east of them. Um, you know, from that point, we say that the war dragged on for six years with the inevitable defeat of the Nazis in Japan um, and the victors obviously being the allies. What caused World War II? So the real cause is the instability that was created in Europe from the First World War. So you don't even really have to look at these two events um, as like isolated incidents. These two things are very, very connected. Okay. Um, as we've learned and, and looked at um, multiple times now, the Treaty of Versailles was not a very fair deal. Okay. So I know I've asked you your opinion and things like that. Some of you guys say, yeah, it was fair. They shouldn't have, you know, gave them that blank check, so on and so forth. Um, but in reality, like when these things were being rolled out and happening in real time, you know, it, it, it was very easy for Ger Germany, you know, at the time to tell their allies, yes, like we're going to back you up. In my opinion, Austria-Hungary is the most aggressive country. They really should have been um, reprimanded at least equally with Germany, but, but it almost feels like they, they got away with, with hardly any um, repercussions. So Germany really takes a, a huge punishment that is just so impossible to pay back, okay? Um, what I really think happened is Germany fought the war really well. They were so hard to bring down that, um, you know, especially France, the rival France, um, they wanted to see Germany pay. And, and that's exactly what happens. So Germany gets so uh, resentful and, and wants revenge so bad, they're really going to be willing to do whatever it takes to get back at everybody and, and, and to, you know, at a certain point, feel more superior than the people that had previously uh, beat them in the quote unquote great war. So leading up to World War II, the devastation of the Great War had greatly destabilized all of Europe, okay? Not just Germany. Definitely Germany the most. Um, but remember, the fighting broke out all over the place. 
um, millions of people died. And unfortunately, um, you know, the most recent pandemic before COVID was the Spanish flu. Um, because all these countries were uh, fighting each other and people are going into different areas and things of that nature, they eventually um, spread this, uh, what's called the Spanish influenza. And it killed um, about 20 million people. So, you know, not only do you have um, places like Belgium and, and France and Germany and, and all these other areas um, totally like just covered in rubble, but you also have people really sick and, and dying at, at high rates. So if the war wasn't bad enough, um, throw on that pandemic and, and it was just the perfect storm. I also want to note that political and economic instability in Germany and the bitterness over the harsh terms imposed by the Treaty of Versailles uh, fueled the rise of power, uh, rise to power of Adolf, excuse me. So Hitler really comes to power because of, again, that bitterness, that resentment um, that was created from the Treaty of Versailles. Okay. So looking more in depth at the treaty. So the major effect of the treaty was to force Germany um, to give massive amounts of land back to the allies. They forced Germany to pay crazy amounts of money um, as reparation. And it really limited the size of the German army to just like a fraction of it once was. You know, if they had 500,000, a million people in their army, we're looking at like, you can't have more than 100,000. So if you add a million or 500,000, you're, you're cutting that like by crazy amounts. Uh, if you look at the top, um, the Triple Entente is in this beige color. You have neutral powers in Scandinavia, Netherlands, Switzerland. Switzerland always, um, you know, is kind of a meme. They're neutral in both world wars. Um, and then you have the central powers, which is this pink. Okay. So this is what they look like during World War One before the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and this is after the fact, this bottom picture here. So the defeated countries had to disarm, they had to pay reparations, they had to cede or give back uh, land as new countries were formed. So remember, Austria-Hungary, um, pretty huge place. The whole reason that the, that the fight even broke out was because many different ethnic groups are lumped into this empire. Well, that empire um, pretty much collapses after and then you have new countries that come out of that. We have Yugoslavia, not a country today, but, you know, pretty fun to say. Um, you have Romania, which uh, actually took over some land. Um, Austria is its own place. Hungary is its own place. Another fun place to say, Czechoslovakia. All right. When you have a minute, try and say that three times fast. Um, and then Germany. Germany gave up a lot of, um, a lot of land as well. You have Lithuania, uh, Latvia, Estonia. I'm sure you've never heard of any of those countries. Um, <laughs> but yeah, really important, um, really important new territories came out of this. And obviously the biggest one that we've seen, um, you know, up top, you have Russia. Okay. And the picture on the right does it well too. Does pretty good justice. Um, if you notice, just all these other little countries like Belarus, um, Ukraine's not very small, but it's there. Uh, Moldova, so on and so forth. So those countries actually turn into the Soviet Union. Okay. Um, remember, Russia drops out of the war early because it cannot sustain. Um, the people were really upset. The Tsar left the home country. He's fighting um, on the front lines on the Eastern Front. And they're losing really bad. And eventually, um, the czars get kicked, the czar gets kicked out of power and the royal family uh, thrown out, murdered. Um, and then some new governments take over. I don't have quite enough time for this video to explain all that, but I definitely will. Um, when we get more into the Cold War, I'll backtrack. So, um, one of the most interesting parts of world war ii is looking at hitler's rise all right this guy really came out of left field um i don't think anybody thought that this austrian man would you know one day lead the third reich um to just this 
really kind of evil empire. So um, he actually became Reich Chancellor in 1933. He consolidated power. He anointed himself Führer, okay, um, which translates to supreme leader. Um, it's kind of similar to Napoleon's rise. He's he's using the military. He's he's using his power of speech and, and wits and and really just kind of captivates people. Okay, um, that's what was really interesting about Hitler. He he won Times Man of the Year. This is not somebody who who during the time was looked at as an evil person. Okay, um, he really knew how to speak and and get people's attention and and. You know, to some extent, you didn't really hear Hitler. You f you felt him, okay? Um, obviously, that's I'm talking about the German audience. I don't I don't think that you know Jewish people were really vibing with what he was putting out there. Um, but but his target audience really felt what he said, um, and he was really obsessed with this idea of the superiority of the quote-unquote pure German race, which he called Aryan. Um, yeah, we're not going to talk about how he was wrong about what an Aryan race is, but just know Aryans aren't always blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white. Um, so this part's really pivotal, okay? Hitler believed that war was the only way to gain the necessary Lebensraum, which is German for living space. Okay? So the in reality, the goal of Hitler is get living space for Aryans to spread out. Okay? That's the major goal that 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 he has in mind. Um so, in order to carry out this goal, um he really has to go against the Treaty of Versailles. So, um, this is a slide from more in person. Um, I asked, how, ha sorry, have you ever encountered a bully? So that's really what Hitler is. Hitler's the bully in this scenario. Um, hopefully if you've ever been bullied, you know, you stood up for yourself or you, you know, you told somebody, um, you know, a parent, guardian, teacher, so on and so forth. Um, I think that that direct kind of um encounter might not always be the best idea so if you are being bullied you know tell somebody and and there can be an intervention or mediation um but hopefully you don't appease the bully okay that's the main thing that i i want you to take away from this is that you don't always appease the bully um so there is a video i'll probably link this at a different time but appeasement okay um, appeasement is when you give somebody what they want. And that is the absolute most trash policy of all time. Okay. That is, um, that's some, that's that we don't do that. Okay. Um, so let's, let's look at it in this context, right? After signing alliances with Italy and Japan against the Soviet union. Okay. So right there, Germany allied with Italy and Japan again. Um, or I guess with Japan is the first time, but. They allied against the Soviet Union. Hitler sent troops to occupy Austria, okay, the country he's from. Austria and Germany see themselves as sort of cousins. Um, they get sent there in 1938. The following year, okay, they annex this place, Czechoslovakia, okay, more specifically the Sudetenland, okay. So Austria pretty much just lets the Nazi Germanys take them over. They say, yeah, we kind of, we resonate with them. We, we think Hitler has the right idea. Um, let's just be like kind of one big Germany. Um, but Czechoslovakia, right? Um, that's more of like a Slavic race. These, these people are more like, more like Balkan, um, Balkan rather, um, than, than they would be considered like a German people. They don't identify uh, with Hitler and what he's trying to do at all. Um, so Hitler made this argument about this area called the Sudetenland and basically what he was saying is the Sudetenland 
is the border of Czechoslovakia and Austria, and we believe that there are a lot of German people living in that area. So I know the Treaty of Versailles really said that my borders are supposed to be yay big, but those are Germans over there. So uh, we're going to break those borders you established, and we're going to go reunite with more Germans. And there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to fight me. Okay? Now, that's where they screwed up, meaning France and Britain and, and anybody on that, that side of it. Okay? When a bully is being aggressive and you give in, you're setting up a, a standard. Okay, you're kind of like, yeah, you're telling them by example, this is okay, um, which obviously we know it's not. Okay, so if it's Hitler or just you know the bully that you know that's in your neighborhood, like don't appease them. Okay, so another another thing that we have to look at is why the Jewish people. Like, it could have been anyone. Um, so why did, why did Hitler persecute Jewish people specifically? Um, so I, I want to point out Hitler didn't just like come up and invent this hatred of Jewish people. Um, Jewish people were actually longtime victims of discrimination and persecution, uh, since the middle ages. Okay. So this is actually a long time coming where Jewish people are the minority and they're really, um, you know, European people are, are prejudiced against them, typically because of religious reasons, you know, um, Christians versus Jewish. Um, Christians saw the Jewish faith as like an anomaly or different than normal. Um, and they really wanted that to be canceled or changed. Okay. This is not a huge time of tolerance as we know. Um, so, yeah typically um the minorities during this time period are uh oppressed um jews in europe were sometimes even forced to convert or not allowed to practice um certain professions and that's going to be even more amplified when hitler comes to um power sorry about the bright yellow um who influenced hitler's worldview so just kind of backtracking and looking at what affected Hitler and, and how did he kind of come to be who he was. So there were two Austrian politicians. Again, he's Austrian, not German. Okay. He did fight for Germany in World War One, though. We will make note of that. But there were two Austrian politicians that seemed to influence the way that Hitler viewed the world. Um, and more specifically, like he, it really influenced how he viewed Jewish people, too. The first individual was um, George Ritter von Schonerer. <laughs> he was a German nationalist. Um, he believed that the German-speaking regions of Austria-Hungary and Germany should be, or Austria-Hungary should be added to the German Empire. And he also felt that Jewish people could never be fully fledged German citizens. Okay, if they don't have that German blood, um, then you know they're, you know not full citizens. Okay, we'll, we'll call it that. I'm sure he wouldn't have been as polite. Um, the second person that Hitler kind of um, saw as a role model was the Viennese mayor. Okay, so the mayor of Vienna in Austria, Karl Luger. Uh, Hitler learned how anti-Semitism and social reforms could be successful. So in Mein Kampf, the most famous uh, book diary, journal, whatever you want to call it, that was written by Hitler. Um, in that book, Hitler praised Luger as the greatest German mayor of all time. Okay, He's calling him the goat for how he created laws against Jewish people specifically. That should give you a clear indication of the mindset of Hitler. Okay, so if he's writing that book in the 1920s, he's trying to come into power and he's telling everybody in that diary, hey, I know a guy that I idolize. He made laws that could that that helped Vienna. And I bet that those same laws, if we put that into practice in Germany, it'll go great. And remember, people during this time are are really afraid. They're scared. Uh, they're angry. Okay. 
um, all because of the um, effects of World War I. Ooh, another bright color. Um, so Jewish people as the scapegoats for the lost war. Um, this is where things get really dangerous. Okay. Um, it's, it's really dangerous when any sort of um, person in political power is pointing to the minorities um, in a group of people and blaming them for society's problems. It's, it's called demagoguery. Um, I'm sure I've said that in class before. But yeah, if if people are watching, you know, the television or, or they're on social media and they see a person in power saying, you know, these Jewish people, they got us a bad deal for the Treaty of Versailles. That's why your kids can't eat tonight. You know, so not everyone, but some people are going to buy into that. Um, and that's really dangerous if, if you're the group of people um, where the person in power is saying you're the problem. I wouldn't want to be in the group. Um, I wouldn't want to be lumped in like that. So this isn't just World War II specific. This happens all the time if you pay close attention um, in the news. Okay. So don't always buy into that sort of stuff. All right. Don't let people be um, lumped into these huge generalizations. Everybody's unique and individual. Um, yeah. So the German defeat. Uh, was really hard for a lot of Germans to swallow. Um, Hitler too, you know, especially being a soldier and, and fighting in it. Um, in nationalist and right-wing conservative circles, the quote-unquote stab in the back legend became really popular. So this was kind of like a myth where Germany didn't want to say that they lost through like fighting. You know, Germans are superior, military, tactical, um, you know, we're, we're, we're the strongest we can't be beat um through trench warfare and, and things of that nature uh so they tried to say you know jewish people social democrats communists these people from the political side were like too weak they they're the reason that um you know our our politics kind of crumbled and so the support for the war was lost we didn't actually lose through through fighting fights so that's what the right wing um, conservatives, these nationalist kind of people were were spreading around at the time. Uh, the prejudice about the, the role of the Jewish people in the war were totally false. There was no truth to it. Um, an investigation was carried out by the German government and, and it was even proven, you know, over 100,000 German and Austrian Jews fought for Germany. OK, Otto Frank. Anne Frank, with the diary, who was persecuted and killed by German Nazi Germany. Otto Frank fought for Germany in the Battle of Somme, where 100, 000, no, 60,000 British people were killed in one day. Otto Frank probably killed British people for Germany, and Hitler put him in a concentration camp. That's crazy, Okay. The rumors are totally false. Jewish people had nothing to do with the loss um, of World War I for Germany. Just had to get that out, out of the way. Okay. So here you see some of the laws being passed. Um, in 1933, there's a, uh, a Jewish businessman, Oscar Danker, and his girlfriend. Uh, she's a Christian woman. But they were forced to carry these signs discouraging Jewish uh, German integration. Uh, they didn't want any intimate um, relationships happening uh, between true Germans and Jewish people. Okay, so this is just so degrading, um, just not right. You know, the this gentleman he looks like a, a perfectly fine person, and and these people are. They just look like they're proud of what they're doing. This guy's smiling back here. She looks ashamed. So not cool. Not cool, Germany. Um, here's some anti-communism propaganda. So I needed, and it was on, on the previous slide, but Nazis hate communism. Okay. They just don't vibe with it. Um, they like to have the state really strong. Um, 
there, there's a few more things. We'll, we'll go into that in a little bit. But um, this right here is Vladimir Lenin, and he's pretty much being depicted as like the devil. So how did Hitler maintain a dictatorship? So Germany, as we know, wasn't always run by a dictator. Um, when Hitler takes over, uh, not everyone's really happy to even have Hitler. He kind of, like like Napoleon, he kind of finessed his way to the top um, through, um, you know, throwing a coup and, and, and things of this nature. But the way that he maintained the dictatorship, when he got into power, um, he was really able to suppress any political opponents and challengers from inside of Germany through uh, secret police forces that all had like certain duties and responsibilities. So there's the SS, there's the Gestapo, and there's Hitler Youth. Okay? So the reason I have this slide is, again, to kind of tell you not everybody was vibing with what Hitler was saying. Obviously, we know, um, you know, the middle class and the um, lower class were pretty easily swayed because they were in such a tough predicament with um, not not knowing where their next meal would come from. OK, inflation was so bad because of the Treaty of Versailles, it could cost you billions of dollars for just like some bread. OK, people's life savings were instantly worthless. OK, children played with the money in the streets because it was so worthless. So, again, not everybody was going to vibe with what Hitler was saying, though. So if I notice that Hitler is breaking the rules and gaining political power, maybe I want to contest that and, and do something about it. Um, you couldn't because Hitler put these three groups. OK. He established these three groups, and they watched his back. So the SS Guard, they have a really specific uniform. Um, if you notice over here, these two lightning bolts, they're like a lightning bolt S. Okay, That's how you know this person would be in the SS. This is, this, these guys are scary. Okay. Um, it was formed in April of 1925. They were personal bodyguards for Hitler. Um, they were under direct control of a guy named Heinrich Himmler. And that guy was right-hand man to Hitler. Um, the SS was considered to be an elite force. And uh, membership was restricted to those who were pure Aryan Germans. So, like... Imagine just like stormtroopers, okay? And that's probably where they even might get the um, idea for like Star Wars, right? Imagine these like photocopies of like tall, blonde hair, blue eyed uh, Germans all dressed up in this like evil attire, okay? If you saw a bunch of these guys uh, marching down your neighborhood, go inside, all right? This That would not be somebody you wanted to see coming toward you. Um. The SS was recognizable by their black uniforms. And again, if you look at the collar, uh, the two runic S's that look like lightning bolts. If your representation is a lightning bolt, you're probably um, pretty scary. So initially, they served as the Nazi party leader, um, Hitler. Uh, they served as his bodyguards, rather. Sorry. Um and they later became one of the most powerful and feared organizations in all of Nazi Germany. Okay. So again, if you saw these guys in 1925, Oh, Hitler is kind of like nearby, you know, they like, he must be doing something important. Um, and they're there to protect him. But by the end of the war, like these guys are known for, Oh, somebody went missing last week. Like these guys probably came and picked him up. Um, this group promoted extreme German nationalism and anti-Semitism. Um, if you're not blonde-haired, blue-eyed, get out. All right. When Hitler became Germany's chancellor uh, in 1933, um, SS membership had increased to over 50,000, which is huge. Okay, that's a, that's a small army. Okay. Um, 
in March of that year, in 33, Himmler announced the uh, opening of Nazi concentration camp in the town of Dachau, Germany. The camp initially housed political prisoners who opposed the Nazis. So this group is also um, helping with concentration camps and eventually, um, when they get to that point, death camps. Um, and we'll talk more about that too. Uh, the Gestapo. Um, again, Himmler was named head of Germany's secret state police. Um, very commonly known as the, the Gestapo. I'm not going to try and pronounce the original name. Um, this this group is, is really scary as well. At least with the SS, you kind of knew what you were getting. Um, the Gestapo are, again, a secret police state. Okay? So they're responsible for tracking down and arresting any of Hitler's adversaries. Um they also help set up concentration camps for the undesirables, okay? And under undesirables in Nazi Germany are people such as Jewish um gypsies which are, you know, Romas, okay? They're, they're they're like a race. We can hopefully get a little more into who those people are. If you know um, Nick Fury, I believe his name is Tyson Fury, not Nick. Um, Tyson Fury, the boxer. He he calls himself um, the King of Gypsies or or something like that. Um, Nazis were also persecuting uh, homosexual people of the time. I told you that they didn't like communists. They didn't like lazy unemployed. Um, and sad, sadly enough, mentally and physically disabled people, um, they actually start the death camps with using those people, mentally and physically disabled. And when they realize that death camps are, quote unquote, successful, um, that's when they start sending Jews there. So Nazi Germany hated people that kind of weighed down the rest. Um and again, weighed down, it's not through any fault of their own, probably. You know, you could have been hurt in World War One, and you're disabled. Um, so there's there's a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, or I should say, Nazi Germany had a lot of issues with a variety of different people. Um, after the outbreak of war in 1939, members of the Gestapo... Um, made up some of the membership of Einsatzgruppen, which, again, are mobile death squads, okay? So now the police are being sent from Germany into uh, nearby other countries, foreign countries, such as Poland and Russia. And they're trying to get rid of the Jewish people in those areas too because that Sudetenland is just not enough for Hitler, okay? When he gets more room for Aryans, oh, that's not enough. Um, until he had everything, I'm sure. So I don't think it started off as this, like, try and conquer the globe, but uh, it definitely would have developed into that if he went unchecked. Uh, Gestapo agents and informants concentrated on finding suspected political dissidents of the Third Reich. So that means anybody who's against Hitler, um, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. So the Gestapo are, are trying to spy on citizens and figure out who's against them. So if, you know, you and I are hanging out in a pub, you know, we're just hanging out, eating dinner, you know, and I say, man, I really didn't like what Hitler uh, said the other day. I read it in the paper. I heard him on the radio and, and I'm just not vibing with that. Um, Gestapo's might be in that pub. You know, for all you know, it's a the uh, bartender serving you, you're your drinking your meal and now you're never heard of or heard from again. So. Um, just, just really a scary time for everybody. And while victims of the Gestapo were subject to both civil and criminal, um, prosecution, the secret police themselves weren't subject to law. So almost like that absolute monarch type deal, like there's a law, but they're simply above it. And so any means necessary. Okay. Which is super dangerous too if if you're someone who's supposed to conduct an investigation um if you're using something like torture you can get um 
you know, not a very legitimate confession. Um, the last group that we're going to go over today is Hitler Youth. Uh, before we start looking at like the the text and, and the content, pan over, use your eyes, look at that picture. Those kids are younger than you. These are children, okay? Quite literal, the youth, okay? So when Hitler's in power by 1933, hundreds of thousands of kids were members of youth organizations like the Boy Scouts, which was invented in England in 1909. Um, but there's hundreds of thousands of kids in little organizations like that. Um, and so Hitler's trying to use his own influence and kind of, um, what would be the word? I guess like kind of like, yeah, we'll just use influence. He's, he's trying to influence those groups and get his politics um, to implement sort of reforms within those organizations. So now all of a sudden the Boy Scouts, they had this one mission um, where they're just trying to, you know, learn how to be good citizens and, and, and how to survive in the woods and things like that. Um, they're now being taught like, oh yeah, if, if you hear mom and dad talking bad about Hitler, like report them to, you know, your troop leader. Um, if you just, just things of that nature. So it's, it's, it's a scary time. People are being brainwashed or, or at least uh, conditioned from a very early age. Um, one of the popes that we've had, okay, for anybody that, that's Christian, one of the popes, um, he was a Hitler youth. And a lot, he, it was very controversial at the time, um, but it's, it's, it's not something that you got to choose. It was either you're going to be a Hitler youth or you'll probably get killed. So it's unfortunate, but you can't really you can't blame a lot of these guys because they just they don't have much of a say. So as Germany was going more toward war, children who refused to join were alienated and punished um, by 1939. Right. And we established that that's the day or the year that Germany starts World War Two. Um, over 90 percent of all of the kids are a part of Hitler Youth. OK, so if you have. 10 kids in a room, nine of them are part of Hitler Youth. That's a huge part of the population. Um, not only did it allow the Third Reich to indoctrinate children at their most impressionable age, but it also let the Nazis remove them from the influence of their parents. So if you have somebody at home, a, a mom or dad, and, and they're explaining, no, you don't, you don't use hate and violence to get with what you to get what you want you use your words you can be peaceful um that's not totally unheard of right uh no more okay nazis are literally trying to stop parents from influencing the children i'm sure if hitler could speak to it he'd probably believe that the kids were property of the state um the hitler Youth was just really a way for Hitler's ideology to get into the family unit. Um, some members of Hitler Youth even denounced their parents. And and um, I just think that that's crazy, okay? That you're literally ratting on your own parents um, that they're not following with what Hitler wants. And again, you can't really blame the kids. It seems crazy, but you wouldn't know any better. If you're being raised like that from, from a very early age... Um, it would just really seem normal. All right. So I think that's where we're going to stop um, for today. Uh, I hope you guys have, have enjoyed the video. I hope it was really helpful. Um, please, uh, you know, give me a comment, a tip, uh, critique me a little bit on how I could make it a little better. I'd really appreciate it. Um, again, I'm looking forward to maybe having these zoom conferences and checking in with you guys. I want to talk, I want to see what's going on. It doesn't have to be about history. Um, but you know, I'd like to talk about that too, but please, um, let's catch up in the near future. I hope you have a good week. Um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.